Uh, my name is Sol Fabrizio. I'm a member of the NBA uh, Green Committee, a former Greens chairman at Knickerbocker Country Club in New Jersey, which is uh, not represented here today. I will be speaking for them. Uh, and I guess I'm uh, one of the better readers on the NGA Executive Committee, so they've asked me to, uh, to introduce uh, Tom Doe, which is my honor to do. Uh, I'm sure many of you will agree that the Met area is home to some of the world's greatest collection of golf courses, from stunning new layouts to classic courses that have stood the test of time. Whether you are looking to build a new golf course or to renovate or restore an existing course, the greens and the, and the green are usually at the heart of the project. Our speaker, Tom Doak, notes that no part of the golf course requires more care and attention than the shaping of putting greens and the surrounding green complexes. And we are pleased to have Tom with us here today to share his thoughts. Tom's path to becoming one of the world's top golf course architects is an interesting one. He's a native of the Met area, started playing his golf at Sterling Farms in Connecticut. And thanks to a scholarship, he earned his degree from Cornell University. After graduation, he spent months studying the great golf courses of the British Isles while caddying at the old course at St. Andrews, experiences that helped shape his design philosophy. Tom made his way back to the U.S. and was fortunate to spend time with golf course architect, uh, golf course designer Pete Dye. His first solo design opportunity came at, age of, at the age of 26, and he hasn't looked back since and now has numerous courses in the top 100 to his credit all around the world, including Cape Kidnappers in New Zealand, Pacific Dunes, and Sabonic with Jack Nicholas here in the Met area, among many others. As Todd mentioned earlier, uh, the current issue of the Met Golfer includes an article Tom recently authored exploring the options and ideas behind an architect's decision in green design. And it's now my pleasure to introduce renowned golf course architect, Tom Dick. Make sure that this is working okay so that I can walk around. I'm an antsy person, so I'm going to do what Frank does and walk around. I don't give as many speeches as Frank does a year, so I've always relied on my ability as a photographer when speaking. Um, the title of my talk, I, I did this very quickly, of the importance of Green's design. The, the actual title on your program is a better one, the gravity of Green's design. And, you know, that's a play on words for me. I tend to build greens that are not flat. Life would be easier if we just built, if I just built flat greens. Nobody would criticize what I do. Nobody would complain about how tough the golf course is. Now, you can't really build flat greens. They've got to drink. In fact, we just redid a, uh, greens in Toronto at St. George's Club. And, and in Canada, they are absolutely insistent on what I was taught at Landscape Architecture School at Cornell 35 years ago. You cannot have an area, a surface area of the green that is less than 2% slope. Because if you do, in the winter when the snow is on, it'll puddle, it'll get ice damage, and the puddle will die. And sure enough, St. George's have been looking toward that for years. And then the year before, the year before we were supposed to rebuild all their greens, they had massive ice damage two years ago and decided to push the project ahead a year and rebuild all the greens. Uh, but so the range that we're working at, you know, there is kind of a minimum. There's certainly places where greens are flatter than 2% and the drainage still works. But I would posit that where you do have flatter greens and poorer surface drainage, you've got more environmental problems and you've got more pest problems and you've got more disease problems because the water doesn't get off as fast as you'd like it to. And then on the other hand, as you keep making greens faster and faster and faster, we can't put more than about 3% of tilt in the greens to where you get to the point where there's no hole locations anymore. So we're working in a very tight range now as far as what we can do. And all of that is based on gravity. You know, the, the faster the ball, the ball rolls faster when it's going downhill because of gravity. The one slide that I wish I had that I don't is a chart I saw years ago in the green section record, and it wasn't, it wasn't for the what I used it for. It's just a chart of green speed and then how far the ball rolls once you start putting it on an incline instead of dead flat. You know, a stiff meter reading of 10 means the ball rolls 10 feet off the stiff meter on flat ground. 
Once you put 1% of tilde in, it rolls 11. We put 2% in, it rolls a little more than 12 feet, it's more like 13. Um, 3 and 4%, still doable, but it's starting to grow because gravity is, you know, it's an exponential function. Uh, the number that caught my eye was that if the greens are, I think, 13 on the simp meter and they're 4%, the ball rolls 61 feet. <laughs> and obviously at 5% with the greens 13 on the simp meter, it just doesn't stop rolling. There's not enough friction there to keep the ball from, you know, it rolls until it finds a flatter spot or a spot off the green where you don't mow at that time. Uh, so, you know, the tour would tell you that they don't want the pins more than two and a half percent, but, you know, that chart tells you that you can have more than that. In theory, you could have the greens, you could be putting the holes at four percent with the greens at 13. That just means if you're above the hole, you have to be really, really delicate because what what you normally hit, the force that you would hit a putt for it to go 12 feet, it'll go 60. Um, those are the things we're playing. Now, as I said, this is not stream song. This is Lady Putting Green at St. Andrews. Uh, one of my favorite places to go out. And you know, I wish more communities had something like this that, that let old people and young people kind of enjoy the appeal of golf at a scale that they can afford to. Um, you know, it's kind of like miniature golf, and it's it's actually more severe than miniature golf. I mean, this is they have their own little clubhouse over here, and the first hole of the day this picture was taken was from these people here putting up into that little bowl right there. You could see the the, the hole for the first hole is cut in that little bowl up a couple feet higher than everything else. You know, they change it around every day, but it's crazy fun, and it doesn't take very long. Um, you know, I'm famous for designing contoured greens, but I really just want to design interesting greens, and that means different things in different places. I've built some really small greens, like this one at Barn Google on a tiny little par three hole in Australia. Old McDonald at Bandon has, I believe, the largest greens in the United States. There's something like six acres of cutting surface there for 18 holes. I had a design committee involved in that, and they kept saying, be big, be bold, and it kind of got away from us a little bit, but they're, <laughs> but they're all fescued by the same token, so that, you know, once you figure it out how to get an electric mower on them and not have hydraulic damage on the greens, that really just saves a ton of money and a ton of work. Uh, I'm interested in greens as a major factor in design, because I grew up here, and all the great golf courses around here are full of interesting greens. That's me putting from the swale on the ninth green at Yale, back when I was a little younger. Um, this is the sixth green at the National Golf Links, divided into three nasty sections. There's a little flat place over here. There's a pin placement where the hole is today with a, with a horseshoe mound in the middle of the green. And then there's a pin placement over there back left. Uh, the front left part of the green actually just, you hit the ball there, it just rolls off the green into the bunker. Um, you know, I've never built a green as severe as that one. I may have come close, but not that severe yet. Um, but I've certainly taken these ideas that I've seen on other great golf courses and tried to apply them to my own work. Uh, this is Kick Kidnappers in New Zealand, the seventh hole, you're playing up over a hill and then way down to the green. And maybe a few of you familiar with the National Golf Links would recognize that this green and this steep drop off the right, you know, I got the idea for that from the, from the eighth green at National, when you're hitting up the hill on the second shot and you've got a 15 foot straight drop off the right side of the green. That's where we get, you know, that's where we get our ideas from, to see something on a site a long way from home and think, well, that reminds me of something else that I saw that's pretty cool. I'll try to do something similar with this. Uh, Frank talked a little bit about, you know, greens are a small area of the golf course, but they're certainly the most important part, it, as I think all of you would agree. Your jobs, in the end, live and die with 
how good are your greens, first and foremost. And an architect's job does too, because the green's not just about putting. It's about how it receives the approach shot. And the contouring is about where it receives the approach shot that are from. And the areas around the greens are different, you know, recovery values from the left side of the green and the right side of the green are completely different sometimes. So that introduces the strategy of where is it better to miss the green? You know, really on a great golf course, a good green has its effect all the way back to the tee where you should be thinking about where do I want to drive it so I can hit an approach shot on this hole. And it's not necessarily just on shameless courses or well-managed courses. I've been traveling around a lot in the last couple of years for my, to update my book on the confidential guide. I was up in uh, Vermont and New Hampshire last summer having dinner with, with a guy after we played a Donald Ross course up there at Lake Sunapee, and the guy says, you know, there's a little, there's supposed to be a little Walter Travis course around here, just on the other side of the lake. Because I don't know if anybody has ever gone and looked at it before. I'm like, well, it was an hour before dark. <laughs> you know, an undiscovered Walter Travis course might have something interesting going for it. So I went around to Grand Lydon Golf Course. <coughs> and it's this crazy little nine hole golf course. It sits up on the, it plays from a housing community down at the bottom of the hill uphill to a little condo community which maintains it. They don't have a clubhouse at all, it's just maintained with homeowners use, so they don't really spend any money on it. Um, but it has nine original Walter Travis greens and two or three of the most severe greens that I've ever seen. This one in particular, I think it's the sixth hole, you're playing a 400 yard dog leg par four downhill. The last 150 yards you're kind of playing out onto a ridge that's just fallen off hard to both sides to this green, which if it doesn't look severe enough that way, there's the profile <laughs> view of it coming downhill hard into the right side of the picture. And then a little bump to hold up your shot if the pin's in front, and then I don't know how to get at the back part. And you know, off the back is 15 feet straight down. Left and right is not much better than that. You know. You know, I'd get shot if I build a green like that today. But that little golf course at a low level of maintenance would just be a blast to play, and it's all because they built little greens like that. We try to build things that have that same spirit on the new golf courses we do. And we've been very lucky. We've, we've worked on some really dramatic pieces of land that suggest cool landforms for greens. This is Valley Neal in Colorado, out in the Sandhills region. Uh, this is the 12th hole, kind of a medium par four. The T is back there. You're driving into the fairway here. You're trying to keep it on the left side of the fairway, because if you don't, it goes down into the deep hole, makes the approach almost blind. This is the putting surface. There's two little plateaus here with a small ridge over the top between them, and then there's a bowl lower section over here on the left side of the green. You know, you really have to understand when you're standing in the fairway, well, what am I trying to do here? You know, am I trying to hit a fade and keep it up here? Am I trying to play long into the back of the green here so it'll stay in the bowl? You know, the last thing you want to do when the pin's in the bowl is land it up here and get stuck up here or hit the slope and bounce away. Uh, so it's a really complicated golf course where there's many greens that you're not aiming at the flag from the fairway. You're aiming at a slope that will let, let it feed back to the fairway. Uh, this is another green on the same golf course, this is seven. Uh, Brian Schneider sitting back in the room, who was one of my lead associates, uh, built these two greens. And that first one, I didn't even give him any instruction on what to do. He just went and built it. And I said, wow, that looks good. <laughs> this one I must have stared at for a month before we came up with a design for it. It was, it's a short par four and it was in a narrow little bowl, more like kind of a half pipe green side. Very steep to the left, very steep to the right up into that dune. And I stared at it for a long time thinking, well, this is not going to, this is going to be hard because if you, you know, you don't want rough, you don't, you don't want the native rough hanging halfway down the hills because then, 
you know, some balls will just bounce right down under the green and other balls will get stuck up in this native rough and you'll have a weird downhill chip out of a sandy lie straight down into the bowl of the green. So how am I gonna do this? And I finally figured out that, you know, I would just use one side of the half pipe. So this side over here is green part way up the slope and fairway grass all the way up the top of the slope and over. And this side, we cut it off with bunkers so that this part wouldn't be in play so much. So the play is to drive out to the right off the hole and then play back into this bank. And you can even, you know, when they put pin in this part of the green, you can even play off the bank to the left and back around to the hole. It's a 330 yard per four, and a lot of people think it's the most fun golf hole I ever built. You know, it took me a month to stare at that to figure out what to do. Once I figured out what to do, it took probably about two hours to dig out the bunkers and use that material to make the little contours and the greens that separate it into level. And we were done. Uh, you know, Valley Neal, like several other courses I've built, I get on this a little later, but they're, they're not USGA greens. We've been lucky to work in some very sandy places where basically the entire golf course would be USGA greens mixed. So there's no point in excavating and putting drainage and everything in drains just off. You know, most, many of you have probably been involved with renovation projects and, and maybe you've been involved with a renovation project where you go back and look for the old plans of the golf course. This is a generic Donald Ross Greens plan drawn in the 1920s. Uh, you know, Ross was building 25 or 30 golf courses a year in, in this phase of his career. And, you know, somewhere in Detroit, and somewhere in upstate New York, and somewhere in Florida. So obviously he wasn't, and he was traveling by train. So obviously he wasn't spending a lot of time on site supervising the work. He had a lot of trusted foremen that actually built things. Ross would make his visit and make sketches of what he wanted the greens to be like. Pretty simple, you know, showing that these bunkers are th cut three feet into the ground. You know, he starts with a zero point that's fixed and sets an elevation at the back of the green, shows where there are major elevation changes and that there's a ridge kind of bisecting this green in half. And that's you know, on many of his golf courses, that's the only input he had. And he had to trust his associates to either follow the plans or go ahead and do something else that responded to the site better if they wanted to, but they were risking their job if they did. You know, modern designers have taken that simple step and made it look much more complicated. And I had to, I don't draw plans like this, I had to copy these out of a book. I think this is Mike Ferguson's book on golf course architecture. He shows, he's showing a green plan. He's, these contour lines are the existing contours before he starts. So he's showing laying in a green and some bunkers around it. You know, the green is kind of, if you can read a topo map, when the contours are bulging like this, it's either a valley or a ridge and you have to read the numbers to see what. This is actually kind of a gentle ridge sticking out this way and then that's a valley working up the right side of the green. So he's, he's set a green kind of on top of a ridge that's slightly diagonal from left to right. Um, and then he makes some decisions that I wouldn't make, like you know, digging a little grass hollow straight behind the green right to the point of the ridge. Um, but he goes from laying out the thing to drawing a grading plan for the green that he's, a, you know, he's, these are the proposed contours, but if you compare them to the existing, you can see that he is changing every square inch within 40 yards of that green into this design. And I'm just not a big believer in that. I'd rather leave, you know, first of all, when you try to do this on paper in an office instead of in the field, it's hard to make it look natural. And I don't believe there's a lot of people that can draw greens and have them turn out in the field exactly like they visualize and really get a good green at the same time. If you look at the top 100 golf courses in America, I will swear to you that zero of them, the greens were actually built from plants. They were all built by guys out in the field, sculpting and watching what they were doing. 
There may have been a rough plan to start with, but that's not how they built the green. You know, the reason I know that is because I've studied all the best old golf courses and stolen a fair amount of information from them over the years. This is a topo map of the 16th green at Cypress Point. It only makes sense that, you know, and all these contours are kind of faint. I hope you can see them. Every contour on this map is a three inch contour line. So this shows really what the green surfaces are doing. And as you can see, the famous 16th green at Cypress Point is really flat. There's hardly anything going on. The back of the green to the front of the green, a little dip in the front, is only a foot of elevation change. And that makes sense. This is 16th hole at Cypress Point. You're not aiming for one side of the green or the other. You're trying to get across the ocean to a big target. You know, most of the greens at Cypress Point are more complex than that. And yet still, most of them are kind of simple. This is the 14th green, the one you play out to the point before the little par three. You know, these contour lines show that's a little crown at the back of the green that kind of divides it into left and right, but gently. You know, it's only a couple inches higher in the middle than it is on the left or the right. Then you've got a couple of feet, foot and a half or two feet of elevation change going down to the front. These contours are starting to space out a little more here, so that's maybe you know, it is a pole location, but it's three or three and a half percent there, so it's a difficult hole location. Um, there's a shoulder that comes around the right that stays pretty flat here, so you've got a pin placement over on the right that's tough, that's really close to where the green falls off the arch, off the bank, and down toward, toward the road. You know, you know, that one, you know, it's not too hard to draw a plan like that and have somebody follow it, but all of these little wiggles in the green contours, they actually mean something. You know, that's the point where the putt flattens out instead of keeps breaking further left. And those are the kinds of things that nobody is going to be able to draw. I can read it, but I can't plan it that way. And then you get to a complex one, but like the 13th green, sitting up in the dunes with bunkers all around the back sides of it and front right. Coming in this way, this is a short par four, an, an uphill pitch, and now you've got a green. But there's kind of a ridge going through it. There's higher pin. There's a higher pin placement at the back. There's a higher left side than right side, which is down low. You've got one, two, three, four, five different hole locations on that green, and you've got two or two and a half feet of elevation change in about 80 feet of green. So now we're getting to the point that, you know, those hole locations are iffy according to the, to the USGA and to the PGA Tour on whether you can use them or not. I don't put a lot of stock in all those recommendations. You can't have a hole location more than 2.5% because I know if that was really true, there's a lot of classic golf courses that don't have any hole locations by modern standards. They're steeper than that. You know, my hero, Alistair McKenzie, did very impressionistic greens plans. You know, McKenzie was not around a lot either. This is the 10th green of Pasatiempo, and one of the very few that he did stay around for because he wound up living there the last few years of his life. Um, he wound up not making the, the tails on the front end of the green quite as severe. You know, this is like a six foot deep bunker in a ravine coming up into the front of the green. So the green, he didn't really take the green out this far in the long term. It kind of cuts off there, but it, there are places where you can't putt from this side to this side. Um, and the green is kind of a series of bolts. But then if you look at McKenzie, if you look at McKenzie's notes, you know, this, I think this is plus six elevation change, it was plus six there, plus four here, plus three here. You know, if you look at his elevation notes for green, they're, they're way more severe. And, and most of them didn't get built as severe as he drew them because the guys building them realized that that's not gonna work. Even with the green at seven on the spin meter, that's too steep. So we're gonna, we're gonna make that a little flat. Now when McKenzie would try to, try to if they try to take these plans and, and do them more detailed, this is one for the Ohio State golf course, which was actually, McKenzie had drawn the initial plans for 
before he passed away. You know, he, they hired him just before the Depression. He did a plan for the golf course. The Depression hit. They didn't have any money to build a golf course. Mackenzie was basically broke, trying to get some more money out of him. You know, I don't think he drew the, I don't think he actually drew the plans for the Ohio State Golf Course. I think that Perry Maxwell helped his wife draw the plans after he passed away so they could try to get $1,000 out of the Ohio State University for their work. And, you know, Perry Maxwell is famous for, for building some pretty severe greens, but here's one, front of the green, zero feet, plus three, plus four, plus five, plus six at the back of the green. That's in uh, 80, 85 or 90 feet, and then a plus 10 mound at the very back. Um, they, they obviously built greens more severe back in the day when green speeds were slow. So a lot of our, you know, these are about the last greens plans I ever drew. It was for a handful of holes at the uh, Whale Crossing, a golf course I built in Indiana in the mid 90s. When I was trying to give my crew some notes to start building greens on a couple holes while I was away. But I don't like getting pinned down. You know, when I worked for Pete Dye, he would draw something out for us in the dirt of what he wanted us to do. And then when he was done explaining to us, he would actually like kick the dirt and erase it so that nobody <laughs> went back and looked at what he said. Because uh, he wanted us to use our own brains and work with what was there and just take his concept and turn it into something that worked. And he wasn't too attached to specific levels. He wanted it to work. And he, you know, he knew if he gave us too much information, we'd get to a conflict where I can't do this and do that at the same time. So he didn't want to give us that much. And that's what I try to do with my own guys. The other thing is I watch them like hawks. This is the first day of construction at Pacific Dunes, fifth green, you know, I'm generally not very far away when we're building green because that's, to me, that's the most important part of the business. I'm completely comfortable turning my associates loose, building bunkers, building tees, you know, making a lot of decisions on those things for me just to edit. But building greens is, you know, not only the most important part, the most fun part, and because of those ranges of slopes that I talked about at the start of my presentation, you know, it's the place where just building something that much too high is a problem. So we've got to be really careful what we're doing. And we check our work as we go. Uh, Pacific Dunes, like Barn Google and like Ballyneal, you know, this is all just perfect sand material to build out of. It's about as good a sandy loam as you could possibly have. Um, so, you know, once we do the dozer work, the next step is just to get on it with a sand pro with a little greater blade in the front and drag mat at the back and start finishing the surface right there. And the great thing about it is it's kind of like the advantage of building greens on this kind of material, it's kind of like the advantage of desktop publishing, where what you see on the computer is actually what's going to wind up on the printed page. Because we're building the final surface here. We're not building like a layer that we have to build two more layers up, and we don't have to put topsoil back over it. And we don't have to excavate more to put in drainage. You know, we're building the final playing surface right on top, and it lets us be that much more confident that we're getting everything right and we're getting all the tie-ins perfect around the green. You know, we go straight from sand pros and rakes to hydro seeding the golf course. Actually, we don't. Have, we, we actually seed the golf course and then hydro mulch over the top of it to keep it in place, because yeah. we don't we don't trust the hydro seed to be as perfect even as we want it to be. But since we, you know Pacific Dunes was the first place I did that on a large scale, I'd done hydro seeding a little bit before on some other projects. You know, areas that weren't going to get irrigation or were going to be tough to grow in. Um, <laughs> Abandoned, the, the weather is so tough and so windy that you just, you've got to tack it down to keep it in place so it doesn't blow away or get washed away in the winter. Um, as I said, you know, we've been lucky to work in some of the prettiest sandboxes known to man. This one's Farm Google in Tasmania, uh, which we 
we were just, most of us were just in New Zealand and Australia the last couple months doing some work and, and playing one of our new golf courses. And, you know, Barnabas was built for $2 million. I mean, there's, you know, all it is is stripping out grass, doing a little shaping, putting irrigation down the middle, trying to keep, trying to keep the edges in tight so you didn't have too big an irrigation system and grass. And it might be the best golf course I've ever built. It's certainly the most, you know, it is 100% pure links golf, you know, all sand, right in at each level, um, and beautiful things. Uh, that's not to say we can't build, we don't build USDA greens sometimes. You know, when you're working on heavier soils, you've got to come up with your own, you've got to come up with some method for doing it and, and bringing in better material. and. You know, this is a, what they call a California style green instead of USDA green. There's not a gravel blanket layer over the whole thing. There's just gravel for the main drainage and then 12 inches of good mix on top. We're not trying to, this is on Long Island actually, at North Shore Country Club. We weren't trying to perch the water table. We didn't, I'm, I'm a little skeptical of that as an idea anyway, but certainly in the Northeast, you know, we're not trying to save water to that degree to perch the water and keep it in the soil, so we'd rather just let it drain out when it drains out. Um, so here, you know, we've shaped all the contours we want down at floor level, and now to build the green right, we're trying to get exactly 12 inches of mitt everywhere on that green. So that's a lot of staking and a lot of probing, and it takes a lot more time, and that's, that's why these greens are more expensive to build. Um, it's much easier when we're in New Zealand than a brand new project. I've got one guy down here shaping a green and you know building up a back tier on the right on this side. Um, we've got another guy up here working on the surrounds and I think he's creating the back tee for the next hole, which actually fits over this green, but it might be a bunker just to the right of it. Um, you know, that's the fun part of my job is working. I've got three associates who who run the equipment for me, they're the most talented guys in the business of doing that stuff. I like to let them get really involved and try to design some things on their own. And so I'm an editor sometimes instead of just telling them what to do all the time. <coughs> and that keeps them very engaged in stuff. Uh, and so a lot of the things that I wind up getting credit for or are blamed for, are not really all my own ideas. There's something that somebody on the team came up with, and you know, we're very big on using interns too, and having two or three young people there who, you know, it's their first chance to build a golf course, and they're really excited about it. And I, you know, I've been doing that for 20 years now, and <coughs> half of you, that can, you know, either the consultant that you're working with, Gil Hans or Mike DeVries or Kyle France, all of their first jobs were working for me on a construction. Um, as I said, when we're building greens, you know, this is, I can't tell which one of the guys that is, this is Etna Springs in California, a little nine hole course, but he, he's, got the, he's got the green welled out, and what he's doing, he's got a transit set up over here, with a little laser, so, so it's a one man operation, but he's checking great to make sure that everything's within, within tolerances of, you know, it's not more than three or four percent where we want the holes to be. It's not less than one or one and a half. We're making sure the drainage is getting off the green. But we're not trying to plan, we haven't tried to plan exactly what it's gonna be up front. We're just trying to, we kind of work from the outside in to build the golf course so it looks like it's sitting on the ground and fits in with all the topo that's there. And then we're just massaging the contours that are there to make them work for putting. And that's the finished version that actually made your life. Um, this was a planning meeting for Sabonic. I got Jim Life over there to the left and Mr. Nicholas behind me and Ron Whitten from Golf Digest helping out over on the right. A lot of green power in, in one place to try to design one 18 hole golf course. And yet, you know, when we got to actually building the golf course, this is the 18th hole and, and that's the 18th green right there with a higher tier on the right and a lower tier on the left, kind of a bowl. You know, that green, I told Brian Schneider, sitting here today, you know, let's try to build a green like the fifth at Muirfield, that little, that little high tier on the right and just 
fallen off left into a bowl and you know he, Brian worked on a maintenance crew at Muirfield so a little bit so he knew exactly what I was talking about and that's basically the idea for the green uh, you know trying to keep trying to keep design ideas simple is a big part of making design cool you know if, if you're building something so complicated that people can't understand what it is that you're doing to me that's a fail you know you have to keep the concept simple you know that doesn't mean it's simple to play that means people have to think their way around but you know don't build something with 10 different ideas going on at the same time um, one of the things we've tried to do a lot in the last few years is is we, we concentrate a lot more than most architects on what the background is for the green this is the 11 pole at Slavonic playing down the hill and then the part three pole play kind of back up behind and play another part three basically because I was trying to get as much use out of the bay frontage as I could in laying out the golf uh, so these greens are pretty close together and they kind of overlap visually and what you can't see in this picture you can't see in this one is you know you off the back of the 11th green all you see is you know tightly mowed turf and then a void and then the next thing you see are the bunkers to the right of number 12 or you see down the bank and you see all this plant material that we weren't allowed to touch right along the edge of the bed um, you know I'm a big believer in trying to minimize the number of grassing lines that are showing up in, in my field of vision because I think that makes the golf course look artificial. The fewer, you know, if you if you go to Scotland and you look at the golf courses that are grazed, there are no mowing lines at all. You know, the, the simpler it looks to the eye, the better for me and the more natural. But also, you know, sometimes the scarier it looks because here, you're afraid if you're a good player you're afraid to get it to the back of that green because you think well i can't tell exactly how far that is and if i go one foot too far it's down off the back and in trouble and in fact you know i mean I, to me that was always theory until when we were working on the 11th of sabonic jack nicholas wanted me to build something at the back of the green to hold it in a little more and i said that's why I'm doing it, Jack. You know, so I'm trying to make it look scary to you. But the average golfer isn't caring about that. The average golfer is just trying to get there. <laughs> you know, but but anything we can do to make it a little harder for great players to aim at the hole, you know, that's the that's really the only way you can stop them from shooting low scores. You cannot build a golf course that's hard enough for tour players today without making it impossible for everybody else. All you can do is try to build little features that make them not aim right for the hole 18 times. Because if you let them aim for the hole 18 times, they will hit it close enough to make 36 or eight times. But if you have tilt on the greens so that being above the hole is worse than being below the hole, and you make them aim below the hole, you make them aim six or eight or 10 feet below the hole to make sure they don't get above the hole, then even if they even if they hit all the shots the way they want, they aren't tearing up the golf course quite so much. You know, that's what I try to do with designing golf courses. Um, this is the first green at Sabonic, probably the most severe one. Somebody had told me when when we started working with Jack that it was pretty common on the project that this other fellow had worked on that when they when they showed up in the morning, the first thing they saw they 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 didn't like. And kind of put everybody on the defensive. And he, he said the first couple of times he thought, boy, that's weird. And then after that, he thought, no, that's a strategy. They're actually trying to make everybody defensive. Uh, so sure enough, every time we go to every time Jack would get to Sabonic, we'd walk the golf course in order, and he hated the first green every time. I mean, like three or four times in a row. Now that's that's not working. Let's let's redo that green. So the last version I got on and built it, and it is. If Jack had said it was too boring of a green and it was too easy of a hole as a very short part four, so I built a severe green and a short part four as you could build, kind of with a there's a there's a kind of a false front. There's a couple pins on the left. There's a ridge in the middle that you can actually pin, and then there's a swale running through the back that's pinnable all the way in the back. Um, my friend Scott Poole, who works for that company that. Uh, surveys green, surveys and maps greens did a map of that green so 
This is the ridge part. This is the back swale. This is the front swale. He's showing that there's four hole locations on it, but they're not very big. Now he's color coded, you can see down in the corner, green is less than 2% grade. The yellow is greater than 2%. He doesn't say what the, what the max is for the yellow, but I would guess it's about three and a half. Because then the orange and red are like where the ball would just keep rolling if the, if the green was super fast. Um, you know, they did a computer model of this, they, the same technology they used to show like the puck tracks on TV for the tour. They can, they can take a topo map of a green and you tell them how fast the green is and they can show you, you know, where you have to aim in order to make a putt from the front of this green to the back left in placement back here. And they will, you know, they showed us that there were a couple of these whole locations that if, you know, that if you're, if you're here or if you're off to the side here, there's actually no way you could hit, hit a putt that would go in the hole if it was over here, you know, like, you want us to fix the green? And I'm like, you're assuming that I want you to be able to pull that shot. <laughs> Which I don't. It's, a, it's an 80 yard wedge shot to that green and I feel like if you can't get it back in the swale somewhere to putt at the hole from there, I don't want you to make birdie. You know, I want it to be, I want you to be thinking more about two putting. And if you, you know, if you can make birdie, more power to you, but that's what makes the whole ball. Um, I talked a little bit about stealing maps of famous golf courses. This is the first green at Wingfoot. Uh, Arnold Palmer's company in the, in the early 80s had a client that wanted them to reproduce holes from famous golf courses. So they contacted various clubs and said, you know, we'll go in with you on doing topo maps for your golf course. If we can have the information, we'll provide the topo map. And a bunch of the clubs said yes. So I asked him, you know, I asked my friend if he could copy me some of these maps. And so I have, I have good topo maps of Wingfoot and Balls as well, and Augusta, and Wimbledon Hills, and Mary. Um, so here's the first, the famous first green at Wingfoot. These are six inch contours. Every two contours is one foot. And I outlined the green in, with the marker so you can see. This is not the front of the green, the front of the green hangs down here. So the elevation of the back of the green is 174, 174 and a half. This is the 170 contour, that's 169, that's 168 and a half. So there's about six feet of elevation change from back to front of the green to 110 feet. That's why I tell you that there's no, you know, there, there are no 2% hole locations on this green. Maybe in this flat fit here for a little bit where that spaces out, that'd be about two and a half percent. These are three percent or three and a half, and that's why when they when they last played a major championship at Wingfoot, they maintained this green a little slower than the other ones to make sure that it wasn't a problem. Uh, you know, some of the clubs that I consult for, they want to change greens like this and make them softer so that they can have them at twelve on the stiff meter and. It's, you know, still have them be really challenging, but not have it where the ball won't stay in the green. And I am very resistant at doing that. I understand Wingfoot is pretty resistant about doing it too. But to try to copy all these contours at the same time you're making the green a little softer is very difficult to do. Uh, and, you know, I look at people and shrug and say, you really have to have the green that fast. You know, isn't that an indicator that maybe the, the green is at the, you know, your green speeds are at the edge of where you need them to be instead of you have to start rebuilding greens because, you know, because what happens is first you rebuild one green and then they want you to rebuild the, you know, the, so then they can ratchet up the speeds a little more and then, oh, well, there's two more greens that are a problem now. I've seen a lot of courses get changed and, you know, Unfortunately, the quality of the work is not always what you want it to be. Um, we deal with that a lot at our consulting clients. We consult for 30 or 40 clubs all over the country and some around the world now. And most of them have these issues somewhere because most of the greens were built under the assumption the greens would never be faster than eight on the simulator. 
and now they're in over that slope. So this is a green at uh, Shore Acres in Chicago. Um, the, the round part is actually the area that they were maintaining as putting surface when I first saw it. The outer line is where we've got them to go now with the green. Because you can see that you know, clearly this, this is a tier in the green, and clearly that part is too steep to pin. And then the, the front gets a little steep to pin over here, and this part gets a little steep. Maybe there's a pin there. But a lot of the pins were either front, middle, or along the back, and they've lost a lot of potential hole locations out here and up on this little crown, you know, you're not going to go right to the back edge of the green. So getting them to take the back edge of the green up to the back or even over the back and making it scary like I was talking about the hole at Sabani got them a lot more hole locations on that green. You know, sometimes the technology is not helpful that, you know, this is a chart showing how much of that green is actually Zero to two percent is the red parts, and two to three is the yellow parts, and three to four is the green lines, and four to five is whatever color that is. And then, you know, I can read that one a lot easier than I can read that one. <laughs> and in this, you know, members think it's cool to look at maps like that, but they are useless in actually building trees. Uh, one example, probably the most controversial green I've rebuilt is the 12th at Garden City Golf Club. I've been consulting at Garden City for 25 years now. And when I first went there, there were pictures in the clubhouse of the old 12th green, not just this aerial one, but also pictures from the side of the green. The original green had pumps inside the putting surface, left and right, close to the edge of the green, that were about judging from the ground level picture, it's about three feet high and pretty steep. Like steep enough that you can't imagine mowing it at green height. So, you know, that was, the, that was the only hole at Garden City that anyone talked about. If you go back and look at the Met Golfer articles about Garden City in the 20s, that's all they talked about when they talked about Garden City was how will players handle the twelve. And then in the 1950s, or somewhere around 1960, they just decided this was an anachronism and it was so different than everything else that, that it was stupid and they should replace it. So they hired Robert Trent Jones to rebuild a new green kind of in the front half of where this was and let it go. You know, in the, in the late 80s, when I got involved with the club, you know, we started talking about restoration and what things had been lost on the golf course. And, you know, I knew this was a really sensitive topic to ever think about rebuilding that. And I honestly didn't know if it was practical to do it. Uh, so we just kept it on the back burner for years. And we did all the other work, all the bunker work and expanding greens and did everything else. And we just kept this, this on the back burner. At one point, the club said, well, why don't you, why don't you just design a new green that fits in with the others? And I said, you know, now I, you know, I, I don't really want to have a green here that's mine. Um, you know, I want to keep giving it time. And finally, three years ago, they said, okay, you know, we're going to, KQ, the superintendent at the time said, I think if you let me work with you, we can build, you know, we can build the green so it's manageable and I can maintain it and you can get what you want. So that's how we did it. We drew a plan, which you can see we didn't put any elevations on at all, because we did not want to be committed to anything. We wanted to make it as severe as we could, but still have it be maintainable. So it was really a question of working with Dave out there when we were doing the shaping to get it. So there are the mounds on the left side of the green. That's the one on the right side. It doesn't show up so well with the light there. I think the, the mounds are only about two feet high or a little more than that. Um, it, one of the keys for me was that somewhere along the way in there, I started consulting at Somerset Hills in New Jersey, and they have some pumps in greens that are not as big as this, but they are just as steep and severe as this. So I, you know, I saw that they could maintain those, and thought, well, you know, maybe we have a chance to do the same thing at Garden City. And I, you know, I'm just thrilled that we were able to put back that feature that was gone for 50 years. And, and I've been really surprised that the membership response has been so positive. Yeah, I thought it would be very controversial and that no green chairman would want to stick his neck out and do it. 
I'm really amazed how how much people have bought into the idea of doing it. Not only doing that, but you know, restoring the, they restored the cross bunker on the 220 yard part three too. Um, I think this is my rogue slide that's out of place when I did my slide. So this is actually Sanders Beach in Australia where we built greens out of native soil. But this, this is sand material on the greens. It's just a really darker sand there that they use in the sand, that, that's common to the sand belt. And this this green took an hour to build. I mean, we just we had to make it a little we had to make a little more of a tier in it because it was just a little too steep from back to front. So we we pushed the top sand material off the green. We we changed the contours to flatten out a tier back here, and then you know make it a little steeper in the middle, and then flatter down in the front. We pushed the top soil sand material back over it, and we're done. Those are the Contours in the fifth green at Somerset Hills that I was talking about. That, that I figured if they could maintain that, we might have a chance to do the Green Garden City. You know, it's probably not a coincidence, even though we, you know, we've not rebuilt any greens at Somerset Hills. We've only done a couple at Garden City. Um, we didn't rebuild any of the greens at Hollywood when we did the bunker work there. But it's probably not a coincidence that the clubs that hire me to consult are the ones that have. severe greens or borderline crazy greens because they know I like that and I'm a defender of it where possible and and I have the experience of trying to build greens like this that still are fun to play and don't go over the top and it's a very fine line. 